Hey everybody, I'm Matt. This is the 10-Minute Bible Hour, and I would like to process Eastern Orthodoxy a little bit with you. I say process as opposed to like explain or teach about, because I don't know enough to explain it or teach about it. I'm in the process of learning about it right now, and it's been really fun. If you don't know me, this is something that I'm fascinated by. I'm a Christian. I guess I said in the last video, you could call me an evangelical-ish, reformed-ish Christian. That's what my upbringing and background has been. But I'm intrigued by the groups that do it differently than me. And part of the reason I'm intrigued is simply anthropological. I, I, well, there are people and they're kind of a different tribe and they do stuff different. They have different ideas and they dress different. Then they sing different songs at church and they think about God a little different. Oh, that's fascinating. I just want to know because I just want to know. But part of the reason I want to know is because if you were raised around faith like I was, or you've been doing it for any period of time, there's this tangle of Christmas tree lights that you have, metaphorically speaking, that much like your real Christmas tree lights sometimes can be very difficult to pull apart and rearrange into one long coherent strand. And I feel like a big part of my faith is wrestling through not just what I make of it and what I do with the text of the Bible, which is something I love throwing time and thought at and conversation at, but also unpacking what other people do with it and trying to see, oh, well, you know, what what am I missing? Why are you coming at it that way? Are there other cohesive ways to read the text and read the history of the church and theology that even if ultimately I don't end up signing off on each and every detail of, I can at least appreciate better and it can hold up a mirror to how I'm thinking about myself and, and my own journey of faith. And maybe sometimes when we have these conversations, I might give the impression that it's entirely academic for me. And I guess that's why I'm starting the conversation this way today. It ain't. It is anything but entirely academic for me. I want to think about it with that coldness, that removedness, that calculatedness, because I want to be fair to the data. But it matters. Like The level of the heart and the essence for me, I'm asking the same questions you're asking, whether you're a person of faith, not faith, in between, unsure, whatever. The big questions, what's the point of me and all these people who I see around me, people I love and know well, people I don't know very well yet, what's the point of the grand progress and unfolding of human history? We're clearly different than other things, other beings that have movement and thought. There's something wild and untamed and enormous inside these heads of ours, the capacity to dream and think and understand meaning and see these patterns. And so I'm very interested in the most profound of questions. I can't help but ask them. I'm not new in this. I think pretty much everybody throughout all of our grand shared human history has been asking these giant questions about who we are and where we came from and where we're going. And so for me, this little trip to go and look at an Orthodox church is one more step in really wrestling through the deep water stuff about what it is to be a person, a person who I believe was made by an entity who has some kind of intentionality to that making, some kind of design to it. And so I want to compare notes, I guess, in a sense, with other people who have been running these calculations almost in complete isolation from me. And so as a result, I get really excited when there's overlap and it's like, oh, you saw that pattern too. Oh, that jumped out at you from the text as well. And then at other times, without meaning any disrespect, I go on a tour like this tour I just went on and I'm like, what? And that doesn't mean, well, obviously I'm right about everything and you're an idiot. How could you be so stupid? What it means is what you're seeing in those moments, if you did watch my last video, is me just having the the needle scratch on the record for a second and go, wait a minute. Okay, so you looked at all the same data, you looked at all the same unfolding of history, and that is what you came to. Oh, that's just wild. Like that, that had not occurred to me as the way to read that thing. And so I'm very fascinating, uh, fascinated rather is the point on a couple of different levels here. And maybe we've never talked about that before, but that's what you're seeing from me as we go through the give and take in these kind of videos. So quickly, here's some of the stuff that really jumped out to me as I hung out with Father Paul at this Orthodox church in Salt Lake City. One, this church is slaying. We 
do not have the same approach to theology, evangelism, the finer points of how you do a church service. But any illusion that somebody like me has, like, oh, well, obviously I do Christianity in the right way because our version of Christianity is very good at connecting with people and reaching people and helping people to work through the problems of life and point them toward God. And like that's great, but these people are really good at it too. The stories that I ran into just talking with people who were attending here and hanging around, they were inspiring, life-changing, stuff that is stuck with me because it's been a long, long time since I stopped by this church for the first time to size this thing up. And those stories haven't gone away. There's something very intentional. There's something very merciful. There's something very empathetic about what the Orthodox Church in Salt Lake City, at least, because that's the one I visited, what their understanding of the gospel and who God is has prompted in them toward their neighbors, toward people who theoretically on paper might even be called their enemies. There's something really beautiful happening there. And I got to hear firsthand, can't share them with you because they're not my stories to share, but I got to hear firsthand story after story from people who have encountered something very transformative in their relationship with God through that church and through that tradition. So one, they're slaying and that's pretty awesome. Two, the standing thing I know is the first question that I asked and in that tour video, like we come in, it's like, oh, it's, you know, this beautiful place. And we got the cool drone shot that we grabbed in there. And it's like, wow, look at how amazing all of this is. And my first stupid question is, oh, yeah, guys, I ain't got no chairs or nothing. Where you sit when you're done doing church? Yeah, I mean, how's that work? But I, honestly, it was the first thing that came to mind is just, well, how does a church service work? If there's nowhere to sit, like you just walk around the whole time or does it get a little crazy in here? And, you know, Father Paul, as you saw, very patiently explained all of that. But you know, then when you actually see the service, you realize it really does make a great deal of difference. And so many of these points of difference, I think, come back to something I want to talk about in a minute. And that is icons and the idea of the church militant, the church triumphant, the idea that you have this small percentage of Christians who are alive, but this grand percentage of Christians, grander all the time each year that the church goes by, or each year of the existence of the church going by, who are also present in the Orthodox mind. Now, in the Protestant mind, they're there. Like the Christian is elsewhere when they die. They are in the presence of God somehow, but we don't really hang out for the time being. And obviously, if I thought the Orthodox position was correct, I would believe the Orthodox position. I'm not trying to argue that the Protestant position is wrong. I, I'm, I'm a Protestant. But I am definitely appreciating how much that assumption affects things. And one of the things it affects is just simply how you adorn your worship area, where people sit and what they do. Oh, somebody just rang the doorbell. I'm just going to hit pause because we're not done talking. I'll be right back. One second. Thanks, man. That was the electrician. I've never met him before. He was super, super nice, and that went well. What were we talking about? We we're talking about orthodoxy. Oh, yeah, and the standing thing. So I get that if you if you view your service as being something that involves not just the humans who are in the room, but the humans who've gone before you, who've already, to use the Bible language, run the race, put their hand to the plow and not looked back, the the great cloud of witnesses who are present, then, well, it's like you're doing a Protestant stand and greet, but for the entire service, and some of the people are physically dead, but eternally alive and represented, ooh, no, 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 that's not the word, represented their, their, uh, Sorry, icons are new to me. This is difficult to find the language for. They are present, I think, is the orthodox position in the form of an icon. I'm so sorry. I know a whole bunch of you here are orthodox, and you're probably just cringing at me butchering your theological language. That is not a slight. That's just, I mean, please do not attribute to, uh, to me malice when what it actually is is ineptitude. Whatever the case, that... Uh, that service then takes on a very different feel. And I could see how the pew thing would be really restrictive 
for the Orthodox worshiper when there is really no other opportunity to do a stand and greet and a passing of the peace and a hello with those Christians who are there in the form of an icon, but who they believe are very much worshiping with them at the same time. So when I first heard that some Orthodox churches didn't do pews at all, I just, I really didn't know what to make of it. And I feel like maybe I'm starting to get a little bit more of a sense of where that's coming from, but obviously I'm still processing that and still have a ton to learn. Additionally, there's the uh, the thoughtfulness of everything. And again, we're going to talk more about icons in a second because I think a lot hinges on that. But just even the little stuff, the representations, the idea of the icon- uh, iconostasis, and just in general, the the attempt to merge some of the Old Testament imagery about the the presence of God and the tabernacle and the way the building is arranged with this modern space for worship. That was interesting to me. I'm not sure I'm theologically convicted that the one necessarily has to carry over to the age of the church, but I, I don't see how you could be necessarily against it in any way either. Maybe the the objection that somebody might point to biblically would be like, well, and the curtain is torn. And I guess that would be a pretty big objection, actually, that, you know, by Christ's work on the cross and in the resurrection, that divider between the Holy of Holies and everything else, it's no longer divided. So I guess I've talked myself into saying that this would be a place where I think I would respectfully disagree with my Orthodox brethren and cistern. I've never tried that word before, and it sounds like cistern. Uh, but that's something I'd like to ask more questions about and understand better. I think I'm pretty committed to the Protestant building style and the theological meaning that comes with, no, we have a platform so you can see what's going on up front, but ultimately there's you know one God, one mediator between man and God, and that mediator is Christ Jesus, and therefore we want the imagery of our room to communicate that you have access to everything. You can approach the throne of God with confidence. That's a lot of Hebrews that has just randomly come up in this conversation. So again, if you've got a different set of assumptions, then that kind of building, I suppose, makes a ton of sense. One way or another, I appreciate that it's not thoughtless. I mean, there's there's an ideology behind it. There's a theology behind it. And of course, the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church are going to have a higher view of the mediating role of the priesthood of the church in general, the church hierarchy, than Protestantism is going to have. It's like one of the key points of theological disagreement. And again, if I shared that biblical theological understanding with Catholics and Orthodox Christians, I would be Catholic or Orthodox, but I respectfully don't. And if you're still here, it means that you can work with that and we can get along okay anyway. So, uh, but the bread, I was talking about thoughtful things. The bread, even the bread, did you see that? They got it divided into quadrants and each little stamp means a different thing. I have people in the congregation don't even see that. That is like the depth that has gone into some of the great literature. You compare some of the really shallow, kiddie lit stuff where they act like there's a whole world behind this young adult novel, but you can tell not a lot of thought was put into this world or what goes on behind it. It doesn't really hold up. But then you go and look at something like Tolkien, and you're like, whoa, he thought through all of Middle Earth before he ever thought through this one little story that he's telling us in The Lord of the Rings. It, it's like that world building gives it a richness and a depth. And that's the same emotion I felt when I saw the bread. I'm like, yeah, maybe you like chunk this thing up and you give it to people and then they eat it. Like, no one is really fully encountering this. There's just so many layers of precise intentionality. And look, again, whether you're a person of faith, not faith, this faith, another faith, one version of Christianity, another version, you got to respect any expression of this thing where people for centuries have sat down and said, how can we best articulate what we deeply believe to be the faith that was handed down from us and what we deeply believe to be an accurate representation of who God is and what worshiping God looks like and what the Bible wants us to do and how many places can we cram full of this meaning because we think it's so true that we want it to permeate everything and everybody who touches it or is around it, even in a passing way. We want a little bit of that transcendent truth to rub off on them. And I thought that was beautiful. And I 
I've come to highly respect that about orthodoxy. But then finally, we get to the the icons thing, and even maybe even saying icons thing is inconsiderate. I don't know, and I need to just disclose that my interactions with orthodox Christians on the internet um, have been the most how can I put this diverse of any of the groups that I've visited and that I've interacted with. And in part, that's a compliment. And in part, respectfully, there might be a little bit of a critique in that. I've run into Orthodox in the comment section. Orthodox Christians have emailed me and so forth, where it just looks like the faith that this expression of Christianity has engendered in you, the the attributes, your attitude toward people is beautiful. It's like you're not troubled by this or that thing that's going on today. You're not maybe quite as obsessed with the end times and how things are going to go with prophecy and what Pakistan and Israel means and what just happened in the news, like maybe some other groups are. There's this peace and there's this chill about it, whether I agree with every detail of the theology or not. I I see what it's done in you and I really like interacting with you and I see a ton of that. Also, you would think it would be like the really angry fundamentalist types who in my internet travels I've had some of the roughest interactions with. But, and please, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just trying to do the transparent, honest thing. The roughest ones have been certain pockets of orthodoxy. There's a combativeness there that I just do not understand. And I I wasn't joking in that last video when I referenced like, is there a pew crowd and kind of an angry, not pew crowd? And these people get after each other because man, nobody has come in hot at me like a certain pocket of Orthodox Christians. And I am, let me, let me just say it. I'm not even joking. I am so sorry for whatever I have done to offend you. I absolutely do not mean disregard or disrespect to your faith. I, I'm going and looking because I'm honestly curious and I honestly respect you and care about your well-being. And I honestly want to better understand who you are and where you're coming from. But man, some of the remarks are like straight up violent. I have to delete them off the channel at times. Like I had more than a dozen people come along and say, hey, if you ever wore a ball cap into the lobby of our church, I'd walk up and punch you in the mouth. I'm like, your priest said it was like, cool. And maybe just don't, you know, take it off at this point. Like punch me. Does anyone go to your church? That's insane, man. I don't think that's a punching violation. And maybe that's some kind of throwback to like some misguided notion of stuff that happened at the Council of Nicaea. And well, if punching was cool there, punching is cool now. I assure you, it it wasn't then. And I don't think it especially is now either. That's messed up. And so that's been kind of weird. I wouldn't say hurtful because people say stuff on the internet, but it's been weird. But In addition to weird, it's also been telling. Like, wow, there is a passion here I don't understand. People railing at me over putting my hand in my pocket and pointing to a thing and asking a priest about it in an Orthodox church. I'm like, I don't, I don't know where you put your hands. Like, pockets don't come up that much in the Bible. There isn't really a verse that I can think of about make sure your hands don't go in those pockets. That's odd. But, and thank you for hanging with me through that acknowledgement of the both the beautiful and the not so beautiful stuff that I've heard back and overwhelmingly beautiful and a small minority, not so beautiful. Thank you for hearing me out on that. But I bring it up for a reason. And that reason is to say, I am better understanding, not agreeing with, I don't think that's cool, but I'm better understanding why your fuse is so short. Those of you who have had a short fuse and been angry, there is, there is something very unique that changes in your brain when you assent to the theological assumption that the dead in Christ are present in the church, that they are worthy of veneration, and that they are accessible, that you can somehow interact with them, that you can bring prayer requests to them, and that they can actually hear that and do something with that, and that that would be somehow efficacious. I'm not trying to be critical, but that that doesn't compute. I Again, as I talked about earlier, for the Protestant, there is something of a divide that sin, death, and mortality puts there. We would fully acknowledge that the dead in Christ are alive in Christ, that they are in the presence of God, whatever that looks like, whatever that means in terms of how time works. 
But the accessibility thing would certainly be a point of departure, and indeed it was a point of departure in the Protestant Reformation. So hopefully we can extend grace to each other and understand that that's just going to be a little bit confusing for outsiders, but it's not confusing to the Eastern Orthodox. I mean, you guys have been doing this for a really, really long time. And so if you come to my church, nobody's buried in there like they do in the Western church. We don't have any icons in there. If we do have some representations of some famous people from church history or maybe an old pastor at this church who's beloved and now passed on, or maybe some characters from the Bible. I mean, they're just paintings. It's like that reminds you of the story. That reminds you of that person. Um, that's a faith example. It's a pretty cool thing. Orthodoxy goes to the next level. And this is why there was such a tremendous theological friction between the East and the West in the late first millennium, because I understand better now. It is a very big assertion. And so I get how it could come off badly to have a guy come in with flannel shirt and with his dumb lumberjack beard and kind of walk around and just talk like he'd normally talk to anybody else and ask questions about things. I assure you, it isn't meant as disrespect, but the icon question, the icon thing, boy, it ups the ante on somberness and solemnity to a place that is pretty foreign to a Protestant outsider. And I'm trying hard to better understand that all the time. Well, again, you come to our church, we don't have anybody buried there and we don't have icons. So, I don't know, you go to church in this room and then afterwards, if you want to play some capture the flag, youth group kids, that's not weird. It's fine. There's a reason that we build multi-purpose rooms. We also really like sanctuaries where people don't necessarily play basketball afterwards and it's a little more set in terms of what it does. And the fancier the Protestant church, probably the more somber, the more respect becomes an important issue in that facility. But respect, that's a big thing. And anything that has looked to my Orthodox brothers and sisters as not respect has been pretty off-putting. And you've let me know. I think I get that better all the time. It's kind of like a video game, in a sense. You've got these equipable slots when you're playing a game. you got like an armor slot and a helmet slot. You can't wear five helmets at once. You can just put the one helmet in that slot. And I feel like, at least right now in the conversation, there is an inventory slot when we talk about the actual Christian life. And it's like the same slot lends itself to only being occupied by the ring of respect or the ring of personal piety and personally working through your salvation. Now, to the Protestant, the latter is very important. An understanding of the Bible and of God should somehow transform the way I think not all Christians agree on exactly what every detail of right, wrong, naughty, and nice, and all of that looks like. But theoretically, the transformed life, you're a new creation in Christ, there's some kind of transformation that happens, and you want to talk different, prioritize different, live differently. And that's a kind of personal process. And so the ring of personal piety and also of personally working through your theology and wrestling with that goes in this inventory slot for most Protestants. And it is a big deal for most Protestants to deeply think through on their own how do all these different things work. I'm sure this exercise is baffling for some of you who are from a more high church perspective. Like, you Protestants have it so hard. I mean, look at this poor guy. He's got to think all of this through for himself, and he's visiting other churches and trying to wrestle all of it through. And, man, that's rough, whereas we just have the truth. It was handed down to us forever over here in the high church, and it's not that we don't think, but— like we we respect the authority of the church and we assent to the truth of the church. And is there wrestling in that? Sure, there's wrestling in that, but not with the same wide ranging nature that you Protestants have to deal with. Did you catch that all of that was in like Orthodox or Catholic voice? And I, hopefully that made sense. So what I think happens then is there's a thing that's really important to Protestants. Those of you who are more high church, maybe this will be useful in understanding people who aren't like you. And, and that equipable item really has a lot to do with the personal journey of faith and the individual relationship with Jesus that, of course, happens in the context of the authority of the Bible and the church and all of that stuff. But I think the church does a lot more of that heavy lifting in the Western Catholic Church, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, 
And again, that is not to say that Catholics and Orthodox do not think, good heavens, have you heard of the Jesuits? I mean, no. I mean, all Christians think, all Christians wrestle. There's just a little different flavor, I think, to what that wrestling looks like. And so if you have a higher view of the church, it would make sense that what you'd want to put in that inventory slot would be the ring of submission to the authority of the bride of Christ, the authority of the established church. Now, there's a little bit of disagreement between the Western Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church as to who exactly that is, which one is the really old version of church, exactly what we regard as authoritative in scripture and who we regard as authoritative, and acknowledging that distinction. Both parties there, I think, would agree that the church is the holder of truth. They know what they're doing. They are drawing on all of the authority of church tradition, all of the authority of the Bible, all of the authority of the current uh, torchbearer of the church handed down from the authority of the first apostles. And therefore, in that equipment slot, what you need is the ring of acknowledgement of the authority of the church. He who doesn't have the church as his mother cannot have God as his father. And so, for me, one of the really eye-opening things about this, wrestling through the icons, the lack of pews, the imagery around the church, has been just trying to appreciate that more. I think, again, broad brushes and tendencies is all I'm speaking to here. I think your high church types will tend to be baffled by outsiders who do not instinctively and intuitively demonstrate the tremendous reverence toward the church, the authority of the church, the authority of the church's teaching, and the honest questioning and wrestling that is part and parcel of what it is to be a Protestant, I think that can just be out and out off-putting. And then perhaps there's a possibility that even slight unintentional gestures might come off as disrespectful when, at least in my case, come on, they're not. I also think this is really helpful for Protestants looking at people who are members of the high church in the East or the West, for us to look at that and be able to say, this respect is not a forfeiture of personal piety or thoughtful pursuit of understanding God or growing in those things. There's just in the high church, there's just much more optimism about the role of the central hierarchy of the church and historically what role that has played, not just in the grand scheme of the church, but in your individual life as you are a participant in this larger collective thing that is the church. And maybe I'm saying stuff that is unbelievably obvious and has always been obvious to you, but, you know, we all move at our own pace. And for me, I'm just gaming this stuff out now. And I'm finding myself better appreciating because of a few little theological nuances I've picked up from this conversation. I find myself better appreciating how much sense orthodoxy makes within the context of orthodox assumptions. And I would ask for a little bit of grace because I think a whole lot of Protestantism makes a ton of sense within the framework of a few key Protestant assumptions as well. What I'm finding in all of this is the more I dig, the more I ask, the more I get to know you, people who might not think the same stuff as I think, the more at peace I feel with the process of faith, the more at peace I feel with the reality that, man, most Christians uh, don't think all the same stuff I do. And that is not terribly threatening. That's all right. The more I learn about this stuff, the more peace I even feel with the people who yell at me on the internet from time to time. You and me, if you're one of the people who's yelling at me on the internet, we're cool. It's all right. Now, thanks for gaming all of this out with me. I've got a bunch more to think about. My next two videos, probably two, I might bunch it into one, will be a sit-down interview with Father Paul to get deeper into some more questions here uh, about church history and theology and all that goes along with that. So if you haven't subscribed to the channel and you like conversations like this, I'd appreciate it if you'd hit subscribe and the notification bell, then you know when it's coming. And uh, I'll try to flip that around quickly and we'll just get into the next phase of our conversation together. Thank you for one, being up for this kind of stuff in general. Thank you for two, being cool with this style of video. I really want the videos where I process a tour or a theology conversation to feel just like this. I, here I am. It's going to take a little bit longer to work it through because I, I, I am working it through with you and in front of you. And I'm doing that because I want this part of my soul and my process to be on display with you. I want to invite you into the same process and I want to 
foster peace and grace and community with you in agreement and in not agreement as we try to think as honestly as we know how about stuff that's really important. I appreciate you. I'm Matt. This is the 10-Minute Bible Hour. Let's do this again soon.